Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Gravitas, presented by Amity University, ranked amongst the top three percent universities globally. Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. We've been reporting on how India is sharing vaccines with the world, proving to be the world's pharmacy. It's a matter of pride for Indians. But off late, some questions have also been raised about India's vaccine strategy. Are we so busy helping the world that we are not giving enough vaccines at home? Is it true that India is compromising its own people to help outsiders? If you look at the numbers, you'd see that India's vaccination program has been among the fastest in the world. India was the first country, the fastest country rather, to vaccinate 6 million people. The second fastest to vaccinate 10 million people. And yet, in terms of percentage, India lags behind many, many countries. That's because India's population is so high. So the problem is not the shortage of doses. India has enough, more than enough, in fact, to share with the world and administer at home. What can be improved is the administration of shots. On Gravitas tonight, we'll discuss why it's time to involve the private sector in India's vaccine rollout. Also to wave off vaccine patents. India is lobbying for it. The rich countries are proving to be the roadblocks here. We'll tell you all about it. Also on the show, what is Imran Khan doing in Sri Lanka? A Vion team is tracking the Pakistani Prime Minister in Colombo. We'll bring you exclusive ground reports. Canada passes a resolution on China's genocide, but Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet abstain from the vote. We'll tell you why. What does Mars sound like? The latest NASA mission sends audio and video clips, images that you've never seen before. And Australia gives a concession deal to Facebook. We'll get you the inside story of this truce. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. Ukraine has taken Russia to the European Court of Human Rights, accusing Russia of targeted assassinations of perceived opponents and carrying out state-authorized assassinations in Russia and in foreign territory. Malaysia has deported over 1,000 Myanmar nationals back to their homeland just weeks after the coup, despite a court order halting the repatriation amid criticism from human rights groups. Authorities sent back over 1,000 detainees on three Myanmar Navy ships from Malaysia's west coast. In a major setback for Nepal's Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli, the country's Supreme Court has cancelled his decision to dissolve the country's parliament in December last year. The Supreme Court has ordered the government to convene the House of Representatives in 13 days. An MP from Pakistan, Maulana Salahuddin Ayubi, who is in his late 50s, has married a 14-year-old girl from Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Pakistan police have now launched a probe. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has threatened to boost uranium enrichment to 60% if needed. The remarks came ahead of a deadline fixed by Iran's parliament to limit some inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Targeting the military responsible for the coup. EU foreign ministers have agreed to impose sanctions to target Myanmar's military over its power grab. However, the bloc said that it would not curb trade ties with Myanmar as it could hit the general population. 
Hong Kong's chief executive Kerry Lam has backed Beijing's plans to ensure the day after a top Beijing official said Hong Kong should only be ruled by patriots. To reduce the pro-democracy opposition's influence in the city. The U.S. Supreme Court has allowed the release of Donald Trump's tax records to criminal prosecutors for probing alleged hush money payments. Though the documents will not be made public, the grand jury investigation will no longer be hampered by Trump's fight to keep the documents secret. India and England are all set to lock horns in a pink ball day and night third test in Ahmedabad from Wednesday with the series tied at one all. The refurbished Sardar Patel Stadium is hosting its first international game since 2014 and will have up to 55,000 fans in attendance, which only represents 50% of its full capacity. The hosts need to avoid defeat while England must win to keep their respective hopes of qualifying for the ICC World Test Championship final alive. Defending champions Juventus are back up to third place in the Italian Serie AA after a 3-0 victory over bottom club Crotone. Cristiano Ronaldo scored twice in the first half to take his tally to a league-leading 18 goals so far this season. Youngster Weston McKenney shored up added the third in the second half as Juventus ended a three-match winless streak across competitions. Are you ready to live with the Wuhan virus for another five years? I'm assuming the answer is no. The entire world is desperate for the pandemic to end. And for that, we need herd immunity. The global population is close to 8 billion. Out of the 75% needs to be vaccinated, each individual is going to need at least two doses for herd immunity. So where do we stand now? At the moment, more than 6 million shots are being administered every day, six million every day across the world. At this rate, it will take five years to cover 75% of the world's population. We started 2021 with vaccines, but the rollout has been terribly slow. Rich countries are hoarding vaccines. There is a supply shortage. Countries like Japan might waste millions of shots because they do not have the right needles. Last week, the United Nations said 130 countries still have not received even a single shot. The global vaccination program needs a jump start and India can help. India is running the world's largest vaccination drive right now. It could be the catalyst that the global vaccination drive needs. For two reasons. One, the population. India has a population of more than 1 billion. That's almost 18% of the world's population. If India vaccinates 75% of its people, close to a billion people will be immune to the virus. And this will encourage more people around the world to take the vaccines. Reason number two, India's vaccine manufacturing capabilities. Here the numbers speak for themselves and we've been reporting on these numbers. Before the pandemic, India produced 60% of the vaccines for the world, delivering 390 million doses every year for ailments like measles and tuberculosis. Already, India is contributing to the global fight. It is sending vaccines to all corners of the world, both under commercial contracts as well as as gifts. By mid-February, India had exported more than 1.6 crore shots. 37% of these supplies were gifts to friendly countries. And just today, a large shipment of the Oxford vaccine was dispatched from India. It is for COVAX, the global vaccine alliance led by the World Health Organization. These shots will be sent to 25 to 30 countries. But what about India's own vaccination drive? How is the world's largest vaccination drive faring? It depends on which numbers you consider. India was the fastest country to administer 6 million shots. India was the second fastest to complete 10 million vaccinations. As of today, more than 1 crore 17 lakh shots have been given in India. Let's compare that number with the rest of the world. India ranks number five right after the United States, China, the European Union, the United Kingdom, when it comes to the sheer number of doses administered, which is not a very bad record. India administered its first shot on the 16th of January. In less than 40 days, it has administered more than 1 crore shots. It's an achievement. But how close is India to inoculating 75% of its population, the herd immunity mark? India has a long way to go there. As of the 21st of February, India had administered 
just about 0.8 doses per 100 people. So not even one shot per 100. As of yesterday, less than 0.1% of India had been fully vaccinated against the Wuhan virus. Not even 1% of India has got the shot. The numbers are very big, of course. India is the pharmacy of the world, but is it doing enough when it comes to inoculating its own people? It's a question that many have been asking. While supplying vaccines to the world is great, is it happening at the cost of people at home? To answer this question, it's very important to understand India's current rollout plan. Right now, the vaccine drive is in the hands of the government. The government procures the vaccines and the government sends the vaccines to vaccination centers around the country. For the moment, only health workers are being inoculated in India. They are priority. The government's targets are very ambitious. When the year began, India had set a goal to inoculate 300 million people by August. But as of the beginning of February, the Serum Institute, the world's largest vaccine maker and the supplier of the Oxford shot, was sitting on a stockpile of 70 million doses, 7-0. India has more than enough doses to share with the world. That's something that's very important to understand. There's enough to share with the world and to vaccinate its own people. There's a stockpile of millions waiting to be used. What India needs is wider administration of the vaccine, more centers. And this is where the private players come in. If the vaccine is safe and the stock is available, the private sector should be allowed to join the program. The same thing happened with testing, remember. Virus testing on a wide scale began in India once the private sector was made a part of it. So why is the government shy of including the private sector in the vaccination drive? It has its reasons. Remember, these vaccines are new. Most countries in the world have granted restricted permission to vaccine makers. And this is for two reasons. One, the shortage in supplies, and two, to avoid adverse events in case the vaccines show any major side effects. India is following global standards with restricted permissions. It granted vaccines an emergency approval first. Reports say no adverse effects have been found so far, so India needs to evolve its strategy and its rollout plan. Consider evolve, involving the private sector. In fact, today the Serum Institute has said that the rest of the world will now have to wait for its supplies. It has been directed to fulfill the domestic needs first. It's a welcome step. India needs to expand its domestic program, else the 300 million target is going to be hard to chase. Here's another thing that is slowing down the vaccination program the world over. Patents. Since last year, India and South Africa have been pushing for a ban on vaccine patents, a temporary ban, only to be stonewalled by the rich countries. A last-ditch attempt is now underway to unlock the vaccine patents for the world. Our next report tells you more about it. The world's leading powers are struggling. They are at the mercy of vaccine makers. The supply of shots has been slow. There aren't enough vials to go around. More than 7 billion people are to be vaccinated, but only a handful of companies can produce vaccines. The reason is vaccine patents. Only companies with patents can produce vaccines. Their numbers are limited, so is their capacity. Why can't more vaccine makers produce the Wuhan virus shot? That's what India and South Africa are pushing for. They want a temporary waiver on vaccine patents. India and South Africa have moved a proposal at the World Trade Organization, but it did not find many takers. In October last year, India and South Africa asked the WTO to waive some provisions in a trade agreement. This would allow countries to waive off intellectual property rights on diagnostics, medicines and vaccines. This would have been a temporary measure to control the pandemic. But rich countries want to make profits from the pandemic. This month, they blocked the proposal of India and South Africa. Rich countries are also hoarding vaccines. They made millions of pre-orders. Now they don't want to share the patent. The list includes the United States, the United Kingdom and the European Union. They have all opposed the proposal. What's their argument? it would stifle innovation. 
a patent ban would rob Big Pharma of the incentive to make huge investments in research and development. So is the proposal dead? Not yet. India and South Africa, along with other co-sponsors, are now reaching out to WTO members individually. Reports say the outline, scope and time frame for the patent waiver is being discussed. The race to grab vaccines has divided the world. Those divisions are showing at the WTO too. Developed countries like Japan, Canada, the United Kingdom and Switzerland are saying they will not back the patent waiver. While the developing world supports it, countries that still need their share of shots are co-sponsoring India and South Africa's proposal. This includes Bolivia, Eswantini, Kenya, Egypt, Mozambique, Mongolia, Pakistan, Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Reports say a final call on the proposal may be taken this month. This decision will dictate for how long humanity will have to fight the Wuhan virus. The more vaccines we have, the sooner the pandemic will end. Bureau report, we on World is One. It happened to the Jews in Germany. It is happening to the Yazidis in Iraq. It happened to the Rohingyas in Myanmar, and it is now happening to the Uyghurs in China. I'm talking about genocide, a word which means the deliberate killing of a group. Why? Because of their ethnicity, religion or race. Canada's House of Commons has slapped China with the charge of genocide. It said China's treatment of Uyghur Muslims is genocide. All opposition parties supported this, but the country's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau abstained from the vote. Why? We'll discuss that in a while. First, let's tell you what Canada has done. Canada has become the second country in the world to brand China's treatment of Uyghurs as genocide. The United States was the first. The United Kingdom could be next. It is seeking access to Xinjiang. It has gone to the United Nations. The United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, told the UN Human Rights Council, the situation in Xinjiang is beyond the pale. The reported abuses, which include torture, forced labor, and forced sterilization of women, are extreme and they're extensive. They're taking place on an industrial scale. Is the UK planning to follow the US and Canada in slapping a genocide tag on China? Perhaps it is. Why aren't more countries joining it? Why isn't India calling out China on Uyghurs? Let's start by trying to understand China's crime. Genocide. What is genocide? Like I mentioned, systemic killing of people because they belong to a certain race or follow a certain religion. In contemporary international law, genocide has become synonymous with crime against humanity. It includes killing members of a group, causing them harm, mentally or physically, inflicting damage on their living condition, imposing measures to prevent birth within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. I'm referring to the United Nations Convention on Genocide. This is how the United Nations defines genocide. Now let's tell you which events have been branded as genocide. The term genocide was coined during the Second World War. The Holocaust was perhaps the biggest example of it. In the 75 years that followed, the world has seen many more. The Cambodian Genocide, 1975 to 79. The Rwandan Genocide, the Darfur Genocide in Sudan, the persecution of the Yazdis by the Islamic State terrorists, the Rohingya genocide orchestrated by the military in Myanmar. Does China's treatment of Uyghurs qualify as a genocide? A rhetorical question, but we must ask it for the sake of fairness. And to answer it, let me show you the definition of genocide again. What qualifies as genocide? Read this. There are five points here. Any of these acts committed with the intent of destroying a group is genocide. This is what the United Nations says. And guess what? China is guilty on all five counts. Let's start from the top. Point number one, killing members of a group. Millions of Uyghurs are missing. Number two, causing harm to a group. 
Uyghurs are being forced to give up their religion, work without pay in Chinese factories. Their organs are being harvested. If this is not harm, what is? Point number three, inflicting damage on their living condition. One million Uyghurs have been put in concentration camps. That's 7% of Xinjiang's Muslim population. In 2020, Human Rights Watch said that China is using big data programs in Xinjiang to quote-unquote arbitrarily select Muslims for detention. Wearing a veil, studying the Quran can lead to an arrest in these parts. The next point, preventing birth within a group. Vion has been reporting for years on how Uyghurs are being forcefully sterilized. Women are being raped and forced into abortion. Data from 2015 to 2018 shows birth rates in most Uyghur regions of Hotan and Kashgar have plunged by more than 60%. And point number five, forcefully transferring children. We have shown you how Uyghur children have been put in boarding schools. They're being sinicized. Their parents are not being allowed to meet them. China, of course, denies all of these charges. Forget crimes against humanity. China says Xinjiang is, quote unquote, a shining example of its progress on human rights. These are the words of China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He addressed the United Nations Human Rights Council yesterday. He rejected the charges of genocide and he said this. Basic facts show that there has never been so-called genocide, forced labor or religious oppression in Xinjiang. He mentioned how there are 24,000 mosques in the western region of China. We say these are lies because we reported last year on how mosques are being torn down in Xinjiang. Do you remember what Beijing was building on these mosque sites? public toilets and undergarment factories where mosques once stood. You see, the label of genocide is not, not, does not just hinge on the scale of the crime, but also on the intent of the perpetrator. And whichever parameter you consider, China is guilty. The question is, why are countries shy of calling out China? Why is the world so slow in charging China with genocide? And the answer is very simple to that, because it's China. There's too much at stake. For almost every country, you see, crime against humanity is punishable under international law. You cannot charge a country with genocide and also strike deals with it. World leaders know this. Cutting China out of the supply chain is not all that easy, at least right now. Human rights groups say the entire fashion industry is complicit in Uyghur forced labor. The world's leading brands source cotton yarn from China. China forces Uyghurs to work in these cotton factories. China made 40, 40 masks for every person around the world in the last year. Guess who made these masks? Jailed Uyghur Muslims. Look at this headline. So if Justin Trudeau accuses China of genocide, he will have to stop trading with it. You can't have it both ways. So Justin Trudeau has picked his side. So has his country. This is what an opposition leader said ahead of the vote at the House of Commons. And I will quote this. We will stand up for human rights and the dignity of human rights, even if it means sacrificing some economic opportunity. This is something that leaders across the world should pay heed to. Canada also wants the Olympic Committee to move the 2022 Winter Olympics out of Beijing. This is if China continues the genocide. Now remember, the Winter Olympics is very close to Chinese President Xi Jinping's heart. He was recently seen visiting the game site, checking its progress. But his dreams are under threat. In the last few years, China leveraged its position in the global supply chain to buy the world's silence on Uyghurs. During the pandemic, it also got Turkey to swap Uyghur refugees for Wuhan virus vaccines. But the very same pandemic, brought the Uyghur crisis under the spotlight. The world wants to make China pay and the Uyghur genocide may prove to be the best way to arm twist China. The progress has been slow, but the wheels are slowly turning. The question is, will India join the bandwagon? We'll be the first to report when it does. Have you ever wondered what Mars sounds like? Well, if you have, you may be in for a surprise. NASA's Perseverance rover, which landed on Mars last Friday, has sent the first ever audio clips recorded on the surface of the red planet, along with some extraordinary images, the most sophisticated to have been captured so far. 
And as the rover touched the surface of Mars, the voice in the control room announcing the touchdown was of an Indian American scientist. Here's a report on the mission, the landing, the amazing inputs it has sent, and their significance in the field of space exploration. What you're about to hear is the sound of Mars, an audio clip of the Martian breeze beamed back to Earth. Listen very carefully. This first-of-its-kind audio was captured by two microphones mounted atop the Perseverance rover. The ambitious NASA mission that is searching for signs of life on the red planet. It landed on Friday near an ancient river delta. NASA has released a high-speed video of the landing. The quality makes one feel like they're riding along. It shows the supersonic parachute opening up, with the rover dangling from its surface. On a downward spiral towards the orange Martian sky, as the rover nears the surface and rocket engines lower it for touchdown, streams of surreal red dust kick up in the air and begin to billow to around the rover. This was the most intimate view of a Mars landing. Soon enough, this announcement is made. And the NASA team erupts in celebrations. This voice was of Swati Mohan, an Indian-American scientist who is the guidance and controls operations lead for the Mars mission. Our travel from Earth to Mars is done, and now we just need to get to the surface. So far, things are looking good. As for the mission, it has also sent some striking color pictures from Mars, including this selfie shot from the rover's jetpack, this one showing the unexplored horizon of Mars, and this image providing a close-up of Martian rocks. The NASA team is absolutely thrilled about the mission. It gives me goosebumps every time I, I see it. Just, just amazing. I hope everybody kept their uh, hands and uh, arms inside the vehicle at all times while it was in motion. The U.S. president called NASA headquarters to congratulate the team. Hello, Mr. President. Hey, Steve, congratulations, man. Hey, thank you so much, sir. I'm so proud of you guys. And tell all your folks down there, I watched it with bated breath like millions of other people around the world. The rover will now search for signs of ancient microbial life. It will characterize the planet's geology and its past climate and pave the way for human exploration. The rover is three meters in length and equipped with six wheels. It will roam around this crater, which is 45 kilometers in diameter. 3.8 billion years ago, this crater is said to have been the site of a river delta. The rover will study the chemistry and mineralogy of the rocks and soil here. Collect them into tubes over the next three years for a future American-European mission to bring them back to Earth. By when? As early as 2031. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. There was a time when China had a one-child policy. It started in the late 1970s. The idea was to reduce the growth of Chinese population. The policy turned out to be a disaster. It left China with a population that's old and shrinking. In 2015, China relaxed its one-child policy. It allowed couples to have two kids. How generous. China's state-owned news agency Xinhua said the change of policy is intended to balance population development and address the challenge of an aging population. What China did not realize is that after decades of one-child policy, it was also left with a skewed population. In other words, a gender imbalance, the biggest in the world. Numbers worsened with high levels of female child mortality. China ended up with what was called missing females. Between 1980 and 2010, male children outnumbered female children by 36 million. Today, China has the world's most unbalanced sex ratio. For every 114 males, there are 100 females. Globally, the average sex ratio at birth is about 105 boys for every 100 girls. In China, there are 30 million more men, 30 million. These men are now having trouble finding wives, especially in rural areas. That's because men in rural areas are less educated and underemployed. So they end up as less desirable suitors. 
And this is interesting. Listen to this. Men in rural areas of Shangxi, Henan and Hunan are reportedly having to offer as much as $155,000 when asking for a woman's hand in marriage. That's dowry 2.0. Dark humor aside, in 2020, the Global Times published an article. It said the squeeze would become worse in 20 to 30 years. The problem is real. What is China planning to do about it? One NGO in China has proposed playing Cupid. It's called the Shangxi Think Tank Development Association. And it says, leftover urban women. That's what it calls them. Leftover urban women should be paired with surplus rural men. Who are these so-called leftover women? Women above the age of 27 who are unmarried, highly, highly educated and urban. If you fall in this category in China, you will be called Sheng Nu or leftover women. China will also totally disregard your choice to remain unmarried or marry at a later age. This Chinese NGO now has marriage proposals for these women. It also has some advice. Do not feel afraid to go and live in rural areas, it says. The NGO also has proposals for the Chinese government. Number one, offer incentives to encourage urban women to move to rural areas. And number two, provide vocational training to Shengnan or leftover men, surplus men as they're called, you know, to make them better suitors. And I'm not making any of this up. And I know how atrocious all of this sounds. Well, China has seen worse, to be fair. Women have been trafficking from northern Myanmar into China. Women have been trafficked. Reports say these women were sold for anything between $3,000 to $13,000 to Chinese families. Once bought, these women were held as prisoners and pressured into producing babies. Another scandal came to light in 2019. Brides from Pakistan were being trafficked into China. The Associated Press claimed that at least 629 women were sold to Chinese men. They were abused, raped. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said it was unaware of any of it. It said the two governments, the ones of China and Pakistan, support the formation of happy families between their people on a voluntary basis in keeping with the laws and regulations. Disregard for consent can never be the answer to bridging the gender imbalance. So the question remains, what can China do about its skewed sex ratio? One article published in Human Rights Watch has proposed polyandry. It asks whether multiple husbands can solve China's gender imbalance. We leave that with China to decide. Mohammed bin Salman's 2030 vision is clear, move away from oil and fund giant infrastructure projects. This requires deep pockets, a lot of money. The question is, how deep? How rich is Saudi Arabia? And can petrodollars fund the Crown Prince's ambitious plan? Artificial moons and flying taxis in the middle of the desert. A carbon-free city with a million inhabitants. Multi-billion dollar bets on high-tech companies. Saudi Arabia is diversifying its economy. And footing the bill is its sovereign wealth fund, often known as Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. The one sleepy fund that bankrolled the kingdom is now a global investment vehicle. One driven by Saudi Arabia's maverick crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. The plan is simple. A five-year mission to double the fund's assets to a mammoth $1 trillion. And a move to create 1.8 million direct and indirect jobs. MBS's goal is to wean the economy of its dependence on oil. And the PIF is now at the center of this reform. The PIF's finances are formidable. It is among the largest sovereign funds in the world. It's been a windfall of sorts. Assets rose from $150 billion in 2015 to $400 billion in 2020. A 166% growth. The backbone of this fund is Saudi Aramco, a bountiful oasis for the desert kingdom. The fund is bolstered by an expected 70 billion payday from Saudi Aramco. 
It also received nearly $30 billion from Aramco's IPO in 2019. While the fund was intended to finance the kingdom's projects, today it has become a mission for the Crown Prince to make it the largest sovereign fund in the world. And he is leaving no stones unturned. The kingdom is demystifying its finances, a move that is unheard of among Gulf countries. But the PIF is not any other ordinary sovereign fund. Its riskier investment profile makes secrecy an issue. And the kingdom is overhauling its balance sheets to address this. Saudi Arabia is creating a consolidated balance sheet of its assets and liabilities. This includes the investments and debts of the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Details that were once skipped off the oil-rich economy's books. The timing is crucial here. The world is shifting its focus away from oil. Saudi Arabia's economy is reeling from the pandemic. And there are not enough jobs for the kingdom's young population. The kingdom is now aiming for a strong economic recovery in 2021. The idea is to use the PIF to fund mega infrastructure projects and pump money into the local economy till 2025. Saudi Arabia needs the sovereign fund, but not as much as oil. The kingdom still derives half of its income from liquid gold. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. The Prime Minister of Pakistan is trying to make friends in the neighborhood. Two months back, Imran Khan made his maiden visit to Afghanistan. And now, as I speak, the Pakistan Prime Minister is in Sri Lanka, his first ever visit to the island nation since assuming power. What is he up to? How should India see this visit? Is it just for his home audience or is there a diplomatic message that Pakistan is trying to send? Let's take this one at a time. I'll start with the visit. Like I said, it's Imran Khan's maiden visit to Sri Lanka as Prime Minister. The last time he was there was in 1986. That's when Mr. Khan was the captain of Pakistan's cricket team and had accused local empires of bias. We sincerely hope that issue has been settled. Also this time, Imran Khan managed to take his own plane, unlike the visit to the US, where he had to loan the private jet of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. We hope there were no technical glitches either. Pakistan's reputation in aviation has been quite a debatable topic. And by the way, the jet Imran Khan flew in traveled across the Indian airspace. In a last minute move, New Delhi permitted Imran Khan's plane to fly over the Indian airspace near Lakshwadeep Islands. This is despite Pakistan denying India the same courtesy in the past. In 2019, in fact, Pakistan had denied opening its airspace for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's flight to the US and Saudi Arabia. This was an aberration from the practice of allowing VVIP aircraft permission to use one's airspace. The question is why? The answer is Kashmir and Pakistan's obsession with it. But India decided to be cordial and open its airspace for Pakistan. And so at around 4 p.m. local time, the Prime Minister landed at the Bandar Naik International Airport on time, accompanied by Pakistan's Foreign Minister and part-time road inaugurator, Mr. Shah Mahmood Qureshi. To their surprise, a red carpet was laid out to welcome them. The Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mahinda Rajapakse, himself received the Pakistani Prime Minister, and this was followed by a guard of honor. Beyond Islamabad Bureau Chief Anas Malik travelled all the way to Colombo to bring you ground reports. Well, I'm standing inside the Prime Minister's house of Sri Lanka, better known as the Temple Tree, where in a while from now the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan will be arriving uh, for his bilateral talks with the Sri Lankan Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. He has arrived in Sri Lanka on a bilateral visit uh, on the invite of a, of a Sri Lankan counterpart. Uh, he was given quite of a roaring welcome, a historic welcome rather, uh, where, uh, which was uh, where he was initially given a guard of honor, a cultural show, a cultural performance, a 21 uh, gun salute, and then uh, Subsequently, he had signed the book now. Now let's tell you what's on the agenda. A host of things. To start with, there will be delegation-level talks covering all areas of cooperation between the two countries. Trade, investment, health, education, agriculture, science, technology, defense and tourism. It's not often that Imran Khan travels abroad. Pakistan did not want to skip any field. 
That said, Imran Khan will also participate in a joint conference aimed at promoting trade and investment between the two countries. Remember, both Sri Lanka and Pakistan have taken serious hits during the pandemic. They're both looking to revive their domestic economy. A few investments here and there could lead to a lot. What about a formal address to the parliament? Last we checked, a speech in Sri Lanka's parliament had been included in Mr. Khan's itinerary at Islamabad's request. The address was scheduled for the 24th of this month. Well, guess what? It has now been cancelled. Why? Sri Lanka says it's because of COVID-19 restrictions. The Sri Lankan media says it's because of pressure from India. Let me explain this. According to reports in the Sri Lankan media, this decision was taken out of the fear that a speech by the Pakistani Prime Minister could harm future ties with India. Bilateral relations have already been strained after the cancellation of a port deal between New Delhi and Colombo. Sri Lanka did not want to risk it further. The timing of this visit is also interesting. It comes barely a month after Indian External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar made a three-day visit to Colombo. Now, Imran Khan himself has landed in Sri Lanka. Colombo had to strike a balance. This was after the latest... Uh, in fact, this was uh, the latest as far as the first day was concerned. The bilateral talks will take place on Wednesday and beyond will be tracking every development in Colombo, every move of the Pakistani Prime Minister. We will keep you updated. But that's not all that we have from Sri Lanka. There's more news there. Remember the 2019 Easter bombings, a series of coordinated blasts took place in Colombo in April 2019. One of the explosions happened as our correspondent was reporting. Three churches and three luxury hotels were targeted. A total of 267 people were killed. 45 of them were foreign nationals. The blasts caught the world's attention and beyond reported that story for weeks. Finally, a presidential commission was launched uh, to investigate what happened. It's been two years now and the inquiry report has been submitted to the Sri Lankan parliament. A total of 10 conclusions have been made here and I want to read out a few of them for you. Number one, the report concludes, and I quote, officers and authorities are responsible for failure to predetermine that terrorist and extremist activities of this nature would take place within the country. Two, the primary cause for the events of the 21st of April 2019 are the Wahhabist ideology and extremism groups like Tawheed and SLJI. That's Sri Lanka Jamaat e Islami. And then it says the primary cause for the events of 21st April uh, that I've already said. And listen to this carefully. It is the view of the COI that the lax approach of Mr. Vikramasinghe towards Islamic extremism as prime minister was one of the primary reasons for the failure. Simply put, this report blames the former president and prime minister for creating an environment that facilitated the blasts. It also pins blame, as I said, on the president of Sri Lanka, then president of Sri Lanka, Maithripala Sirisena. It says there is a criminal liability on his part and recommends criminal proceedings against him. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but ever since the Rajapaksas came to power, there have been numerous reports of politi political witch hunts in Sri Lanka. Since December 2019, several former ministers, even sitting MPs, have been put behind bars. Now, the former president and the former prime minister are being blamed for a terror attack. Criminal proceedings are being suggested against them on charges that seem unsubstantiated to some. While on, on the other hand, those close to the Rajapaksas are being pardoned. According to reports, a separate presidential commission was formed on quote-unquote political victimization. Now this commission has called for the pardoning of 25 former military officers. Most of them were accused of war crimes and human rights abuses. And they also happen to be close allies of the Rajapaksas. The political dynamics in Sri Lanka have changed. The Rajapaksas are ruling with a heavy hand, targeting those against them and protecting those with them. The Presidential Commission report that has been released lacks concrete evidence. The conclusions seem to have been drawn on the basis of mere hearsay on statements made by the previous Sri Lankan government on lapses that were publicly acknowledged. I say this because just after a, a few days after the blasts in 2019, I traveled to Colombo and interviewed the Prime Minister himself, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. He very categorically said that Sri Lanka did not act fully on the intelligence provided and that is where the problem lied.
Take a look at this. Know for a fact that there was a lapse, but whose fault was it? Well, uh, the information didn't flow up and the information that went down was not acted fully. Because if the information that went down was acted on, you could have prevented all the blasts or at least many of the blasts. One of them could have taken place. There are claims that a political conspiracy could have led to these lapses and this is a very serious claim. Do you believe this? And more importantly, are you going to investigate a charge like this? If there's any evidence of political in conspiracy, yes, we will inquire into it. At the moment, we are looking into lapses in the system itself and inactivity. Australia has friended Facebook again. The social media giant will reverse its news ban in the country after a compromise. So did the Morrison government make a concession to Facebook? And what does it mean for the growing campaign to make tech giants pay for news? Here's a report. Australia's bitter battle with big tech has ended with a compromise. News will return to Facebook. The Australian government has struck a deal with the social media giant. Well, Facebook has refriended Australia, and Australian news will be restored to the Facebook platform. And Facebook has committed to entering into good faith negotiations with Australian news media businesses in seeking to reach agreements to pay for content. Australia has granted minor concessions to Facebook. This includes more time to cut deals with publishers and a way to avoid the new code. If Facebook makes significant contributions to the Australian news industry. In the coming days, users will be able to share news again on Facebook and Instagram. But Facebook is walking away from the negotiating table with a bloody nose. And I think some of this is a, a compromise that Facebook had to make. As soon as you start to see uh, ministers saying, well, our departments will no longer advertise and co large corporates being asked the question, well, can you ethically advertise on Facebook anymore? The major driver of Facebook, which isn't users, it's advertising, suddenly becomes critical. This is just the beginning. Australia's win against big tech has emboldened countries around the world and even triggered a battle between tech giants. The next battleground could be Europe. Some European lawmakers want big tech to pay. Microsoft has jumped into the debate. It is now teaming up with European publishers and pushing for a system to make big tech pay for news. Microsoft is joining hands with two lobbying groups, the European Publishers Council and News Media Europe. Two groups, representing European newspapers and magazine publishers, will also participate. Google, too, has realized it can no longer avoid the debate. After striking deals in Australia, it has returned to the negotiating table in Spain. In 2014, Spain introduced what was called a Google tax, a law that made it mandatory for the tech giant to pay a licensing fee for carrying news. This led to the shutdown on Google News in Spain in 2014. Now Google is pushing for a different model, a model that allows publishers to choose their own business model instead of a compulsory paid license. In recent weeks, as Australia debated its media bill, lawmakers and stakeholders in the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom expressed their support for the new law. They have signaled their intent to replicate Australian laws. Tech giants paying for news globally now looks inevitable. Bureau report, we are World is One. Slipping into a short break. Up next, Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching. We are now available in the United States. Download the app now. We own India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa.